Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is God's word. Good morning again. Thank you, Allison. When I was in high school, I worked at a little local municipal muni golf course, small town, and we had a a policy regarding lost and found. As you can imagine, at a golf course, you find all kinds of things that people leave behind. Uh, Usually, it's not worth very much but occasionally it is it can be a nice club or in the case of the story I'm going to tell you a really nice watch and the policy for the lost and found was if something stayed in lost and found for over a month then whoever had dibs on it could have it so this I mean I I don't know if it was a nice watch or not having grown up small town country boy but it appeared to be a really nice watch so I you know was counting the days the month goes by sweet so I start wearing the watch. I'm getting good compliments on it. I've worn it for two or three weeks. And early one Saturday morning, I did a number of things at the course. I'd, you know, pick up the range balls. There was limited staff. Washed the carts. Worked in the pro shop. I was in the pro shop on a Saturday morning, really early, when a foursome came in to check in. They paid for their green fan cart. Were headed out to start their round. And then one of the men in the group came back and said, "Hey, son." I was only 16 or 17. Son. I played here like, man, it must have been like two or three months ago, and I left my watch, (laughs) you can see where this is going, in a cart, and I'm sure, like, I called up, and nobody said they knew where it was, and I just, is there any way y'all found, and I've got his watch on my wrist, (laughs) like he's described it, it's clearly the watch I'm wearing, but he didn't know, he was, because I was kind of hiding it. And so I didn't know what, I just kind of real quick took it. I was like, is this it? (laughs) And he said, oh my gosh, thank you. You found it. And he grabbed it and he put it on his wrist and he just went bopping out of the pro shop. And then as he turned to go out to the carts, there's a window right there into the pro shop. And I kind of got a look of, right? (laughs) My watch was on his wrist. (laughs) But it was the joy and finding what he had lost. And what I want to get you to think about this morning is to whatever extent you have felt lost or even feel lost right now in relation to God, to Jesus, what if the moment he finds you, he is so overwhelmed with complete joy that he doesn't remember that you were even lost. He is simply enthralled with finding you. That's how the story ends. The shepherd brings the whole town to a party to rejoice that the lost sheep has been found. He's not worried about how the sheep got lost. He's just really excited that the sheep has come home. There's a few things we're going to look at in this very brief parable. Uh, What you need to know about Jesus, what you need to know about being lost, and what you need to know about being found. What you need to know about Jesus first, and this happens before the parable even starts, Jesus enjoyed eating with sinners, and sinners really enjoyed being around him and listening to him. Luke prefaces the parable by saying, sinners were all gathering around to hear him, and then the Pharisees and teachers of the law mutter, this man welcomes sinners 
and eats with them. Eating with them would have been, as clearly, particularly offensive to the Pharisees and teachers of the law because of their commitment to do prior to any meal what was called a ritual cleansing. It was kind of like their ancient version of hand sanitizer. You got to wash up before you eat a meal. On the other hand, Jesus would, he would go to eat with somebody that didn't wash his hands after he used the bathroom. Somebody, oh, God, you can't handle that. He ate with dirty folks. He, he gathered around with outcasts misfits, rejects, the blatantly irreligious, the obviously immoral. So if you claim to be his follower, remember those, I think Southwest still has these commercials where they create a scenario that's pretty embarrassing for someone, and then at the end, uh, now they want to get away. In light of Jesus's time spent with the dregs with the dark with the sinners and their joy in being around him who sits at your table who never sits at your table who would you be very uncomfortable if you knew we're coming over for dinner tonight Who is repulsive to you? What does it say about followers of Jesus? I I would claim to be one. What does it say about us when sinners don't enjoy being around us? When sinners don't want to share a meal with us? When they don't want to hear what we have to say? Instead, we have bumper stickers like this is probably my favorite all-time bumper sticker. Jesus, save me from your followers. It's funny on the one hand, deeply convicting on the other. I have a friend, Mo Leverett, who for many, many years uh, ran a ministry school in the lower ninth ward of New Orleans. Uh, It's no longer there because Hurricane Katrina uh, destroyed it. Moe's no longer there. But Moe taught a seminary class that I took called Theological Foundations of Urban Ministry. And I'll never forget one day in the class, he said, New Orleans is the closest approximation to a city like heaven on earth. And we were, uh, he said, we know how to have a party. We are so welcoming to sinners. And we have the best food. If you get that, then you get what Jesus is doing in that story, in this story. If that kind of makes you upset or that offends you, then this parable's for you. Hey, listen, it it's not like these sinners that Jesus enjoyed eating with and enjoyed they enjoyed spending time with. Them. It's not like they stopped sinning because they're hanging out with Jesus. If you just read the Gospels, the disciples never get it. They don't get it till the Spirit comes in, August, in, in Acts chapter 2 after Jesus is resurrected and ascended to heaven. That's when they finally start to get the Gospel. And those are like the best crop of sinners that were hanging out with him. Those are the ones he spent the most time with. But just kind of the run of the mill sinners that enjoyed eating with him and gathering around him, it's not like they stopped sinning. They kept sinning. But he didn't stop eating with them because he genuinely loved them. That's the first thing you need to know about Jesus. He enjoyed eating with sinners, and sinners enjoyed being around him. So if you feel like a sinner, then you're in good company with Jesus. Second thing you need to know about Jesus is that Jesus liked to pick fights with religious people. Luke writes, Jesus told them this parable. Well, well, the them probably refers back to the verse before it where it said the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, He eats with sinners. Now, they're the good guys. 
Look, if you were trying to find a good neighborhood to live in in Houston, and this was ancient times, you'd want to find the neighborhood where all the Pharisees and teachers of the law live. They're going to keep their trash picked up. They're going to keep their lawns mowed. If a gutter breaks, they're going to fix it. They're going to bring you a meal if you're sick. These were good guys, Pharisees and teachers of the law, and their families. You'd want to join a pool where there were a lot of Pharisees and teachers of the law that were members. But Jesus picks a fight with them by telling them this parable and the two that follow it. And, and the bad, if they're the good guys, it's not that the bad guys aren't there. He's just talking to them. The bad guys are there. I mean, they gathered around him. Luke says that, the tax collectors in the center. So get this, this parable, the bad guys get to listen in as Jesus dresses down the good guys. Jesus loves to spend time with sinners, and sinners love to eat with him and hang out with him. Jesus likes to pick a fight with religious people, and then the other thing you need to know about Jesus is that he's very preoccupied with the lost and not the found. This is the parable itself. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And they probably would have been like, well, I don't know if I would do that or not. Leave all 99 just out in the open? I mean, I've just lost one. Maybe we'll just, you know, sacrifice him. Keep the night. Jesus, again, all parables, his kingdom, the gospel, is constantly spinning everything that you think you know on its head. This shepherd, him, he leaves the 99 because he's preoccupied with the lost. What about you? If you're a follower of Jesus. You see, in this parable, what Jesus is declaring is that I am preoccupied with those who are not preoccupied with me. Did you come here today not that preoccupied with Jesus? He's preoccupied with you. If you're not preoccupied with him, if you're not often on his mind, you're often on his. In fact, he's preoccupied with you. He's very focused on you. Then Jesus' greatest joy is like the joy of the shepherd. When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He doesn't get upset. i got to carry the sheep back home. No, he says, it doesn't just say he experiences joy when he gets back home. He experiences joy putting the sheep on his shoulders and carrying it back home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors. Jesus is preoccupied with those not preoccupied with him, and his greatest joy comes when he finds what's lost, when he fixes what's broken, when he heals what's sick. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, again, want to get away? What about you? What about me? This is deeply convicting as a pastor. You know why? Because inordinate amount of time on my calendar are spent with followers of Jesus, not the lost. This is, this is convicting for me. I'll never forget we lived in Atlanta for three years. I was a chaplain at a, a school, but we had some good friends whose neighborhood we moved into that were planting a new church. Still around today, it's a wonderful church called Atlanta West Side. Um, and we, it was really early on. We had not started public worship yet, and we had a, uh, Walter was his name, the pastor. He had, can, y'all, can you and Katie host a prayer gathering? Yeah, 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 sure. So we hosted a prayer gathering in our home right as this church was beginning. And a, a couple, a family that lived up the street from us, Jeff and Hannah Heck, they got four kids now. They didn't have any kids at the time. Um, Hannah comes in our front door for the prayer meeting, sits down with everyone. Jeff's not with her. We, we kind of get the prayer meeting going, and, and Hannah interrupts Walter and says, hey, Walt, I'm so sorry. Jeff is not able to make it tonight. Um, he's actually hanging out in our backyard with a neighbor who's kind of really curious about the hops that Jeff is growing in our backyard. Jeff is now CEO of a microbrewery <laughs> in Atlanta called Monday Night Brewing. And he, at that point, was growing hops in his backyard for the start of Monday Night Brewing. And a neighbor who was lost and not a follower of Jesus had come over 
very intrigued by the how he was growing hops in his backyard. And so Hannah comes to the prayer gathering and says, Hey, Pastor, I'm sorry Jeff's not going to be able to come to the prayer gathering tonight. And Walter had the most brilliant response. He said, Okay, teaching moment for everybody. If you ever have the opportunity to hang out with someone who does not know Jesus instead of coming to the prayer meeting, don't you ever dare come to the prayer meeting. What are we about? Jesus was preoccupied with the lost. Final thing you need to know about Jesus is that he practiced what I would call the holiness of sarcasm. It's kind of odd the way the parable ends if you look at it theologically. Here's what Jesus says. He says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Okay, I got that. That's pretty simple and clear. Sinners need to repent than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, the premise here is that righteous persons, righteous people, if you're truly righteous, then you don't need to repent. And I agree with that. That's true theologically. Only sinners need to repent. But do you think that what Jesus is saying to those he's telling the parable, remember the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, do you think that he is telling them, the religious leaders, Y'all are righteous. You don't need to repent. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. This is one of those moments in Scripture where it would really help if we had an audio recording of Jesus. How did he sound? What tones did he use when he said this? Gauge in a little imagination with me. He's, he's looking at them. He's telling the parable to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, and now he changes his gaze to the sinners and the tax collectors. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 persons who don't need to? Do you get it? It's, in my estimation, some sarcasm here at the end. Because the only thing that can keep you from being found by Jesus is a refusal to admit that you're lost. The only thing that can keep you from receiving the forgiveness of Jesus is refusing to ask him to be forgiven. And that leads into the second thing we learn in this parable that was what you need to know about Jesus. Now, what you need to know about being lost. There's two ways of being lost. There's the obvious way, by being bad. That's what the sinners and tax collectors were. Just look at the Ten Commandments and fail, 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 fail. They're bad. They break the rules. They do what they want to do. They're all in it for themselves. They rob people. They're bad. They're lost. It's obvious. But there's another way of being lost that's not so obvious. And it's by being really, really good. And that's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're really, really good. And they're just as lost. Here's how. And it's also why the not-so-obvious way is actually more dangerous. I ask you kind of three questions to try to tease out to what extent you and I are actually lost by being good. First, when you do something bad, when you do something you know is wrong, do you try to cover it up by doing something good? That's you trying to be your own savior. You do something bad and you try to cover it up by doing something good in the hopes that if it was a bad committed against a particular someone, the good you do will kind of alleviate the bad or maybe they won't even ask me. Second, when you, 
again, when you mess up or blow it, or maybe even, this is a good way to think about it, when you violate your own conscience. We all have running lists of things that we are convinced we'll never do. I, I've worked with teenagers for many, 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 many years, and they, you know, in a school context, they would often do something that uh, was wrong, and there was going to be a consequence for them. And I would ask them, I would say, hey, when you were in middle school, could you have ever imagined doing what you just did? They'd be like, no. I never thought I would do this in middle school. Cheat on a test, get drunk, use drugs, whatever. I would say, do you still have some lists of things in your mind that you think you'll never do? And he or she would be like, yeah. I was like, so how do you know? So the question is, is when you do mess up, when you blow it, when you violate your own conscience, you don't live up to your own standard, do you ever try to console yourself by convincing yourself that at least you're not as bad as that person? Or at least you haven't done that yet? Well, see, this is just you saying you don't need a Savior. The first one was you become your own Savior. The second example is you convince yourself you don't actually need a savior and then and just bear in mind that when i come up with lists like this they're really easy to come up with for a reason <laughs> i trust you know what i mean when someone doesn't come through for you doesn't keep a promise the way you would have kept it for them when someone doesn't come through for you the way you would have come through for them do you ever and you would never say this out loud but you say it inside man if everyone else was just a little bit more like me the world would be a much better place you ever do that oh, this is the worst this is when actually you are the savior These are all examples of way in which you can be a really, really good, moral, ethical, upstanding person, but be just as lost as the immoral, the unethical, the unrighteous. So there's two ways of being lost. The other thing you need to know about being lost from this parable is that there are two things worse than being lost. There's two ways of being lost, and then there's two things worse than being lost one is being lost and not realizing it like we went on uh vacation a few weeks ago over fourth of july and we were we were staying at a place west of san antonio and i had never really come back to houston from way out west of san antonio so i hadn't taken i-10 right through downtown san antonio there's a lot of different roads that fall off of i-10 and so i'm trying to stay focused but i'm getting distracted and i reached what i thought was the last kind of veer off to stay on I-10 East to get us to Houston, well, first to Bucky's and then to Houston. But I missed one, and I ended up going on I-35. I drove 30 minutes south to Mexico <laughs> before I realized I was on I-35 South, before the thought occurred to me, this doesn't look right. These exit numbers are not the right numbers. They're too low. And then I confess to everyone. I mean, you kind of have to. You go, why are we turning around? Uh, and got back on. But I was very, very late. So, so that's one thing that's worse than being lost. It's, it's one thing to be lost, but it's another thing to be lost and not realize that you're lost. But that's not as bad as being lost and not being able to admit that you're lost. How asinine would it have been if in the car I said, no, 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 this is a better way. <laughs> We're going to take the scenic route. We'll just keep going. Y'all are taking Spanish. We'll go get some good practice. No. Being lost and not being able to admit it, that's the good guys in this story. Let me give you three three-word phrases as a diagnostic tool for whether or not you're able to admit that you're lost. Can you say, I was wrong? How often do you say those three words? I was wrong. I am wrong. Second, 
I am sorry. And not like when you're a little kid and you, you did something. I'm sorry. Hey, you need to say you're sorry. Fine, I'm sorry. Not like that. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Third one, I need help. I was wrong, I'm sorry, and I need help. Those are three things that those who know they're lost, they realize it, they're free to admit it, that's what they say. So in this parable, you have this kind of juxtaposition between who we find out at the end are the repentant and who are the so-called righteous. Remember, Jesus says 99 righteous people don't have to repent, but, but they're obviously not righteous. They're so-called righteous. They think they're righteous. They don't realize that they're lost or they can't admit that they're lost. And Jesus, there's kind of a toggle in this parable between the repentant and the so-called righteous. The repentant draw near to Jesus because they genuinely want to listen to what he has to say. Do you want to listen to what Jesus has to say? The so-called righteous pull away from Jesus and they mutter complaints because they like to hear what they have to say. That verb means mutter to keep on grumbling. It's a continuous cacophony of criticism. Do you know where you find that? That continuous cacophony of criticism? Church. You find it at church. You find it at all churches. Constantly criticizing. Because you're preoccupied with the found instead of the lost. The repentant in the parable, they realize they're prone to wandering away and getting lost. But the so-called righteous, they only think that others wander away. They'll never get lost. The repentant know they need a shepherd to carry them all the way back home because that's the only way they're going to get all the way back home. Not just with a little help or a little cajoling, but you got to put me on your shoulders and carry me all the way back. That's really what repentance is. It's just letting Jesus carry you. Repentance is holding on to Jesus, knowing that it's only his hold of you that keeps you holding on to Jesus. That shepherd lets go of those sheep's feet, and it's a goner. The so-called righteous, they don't need, know they need the shepherd to carry them all the way back home, or they think they're already home. Or, I can make it back on my, hey, thanks for finding me, Jesus, but I'll find my way back on my own. And then finally, the repentant kickstart joy in heaven. And you know what the so-called righteous are? Man, they're killjoys on earth. The repentant kickstart joy in heaven. The angels break out in song. You want to know what will cause angels to praise? I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I need help. I had a really fun time this summer reading a book called Dispatches from Pluto, Lost and Found in the Mississippi Delta. It's a memoir written by written by an Englishman who has lived in New York City all his life and through a crazy chain of events he winds up purchasing a home in the Mississippi Delta and he writes a, a book it's a, just a memoir of stories from the Delta and at the end of one of those stories he says this was a typical Delta story it contained it contained mischief the clever whimsical use of language and the humiliation of a tight-assed authority figure. As such, it was also typical of a story you might hear in Ireland. I wish he had read the Gospels. Because he could have written, it was also typical of a story you might hear Jesus tell. Mischief. The clever, whimsical use of language and the humiliation of tight-assed authority figures. And if you're really concerned because I just said ass, then this parable's for you. (laughs) 
One commentator writes about this parable, a sheep lost from its flock becomes quickly agitated and disoriented and must be carried back to the other sheep. And this is most easily accomplished by placing the sheep on one's shoulders. I've already alluded to this. Friends, here's the gospel. A lost sheep will never come home on their own. Not even if somebody finds them and tries to nudge them there. What must the shepherd do? He must put the sheep upon his shoulders and carry it all the way back home because for a lost sheep to come home, it must be returned home by a shepherd. A lost sheep's homecoming is solely the result of the rescue efforts of the shepherd. Lost sheep contribute nothing to being found that's the gospel you just collapse on the shepherd you recognize that his hold of me is what keeps me bound to him otherwise put me down on the ground and just like a sheep I'm going to run away which brings me to the last point, what you need to know about being found. And I have to credit my wife for this. Um, I told her I was preaching on this parable, and she, she jumped to life and shared what's become my final point. And that's this. Jesus doesn't just bring the lost sheep home to be with him. He brings the lost sheep home to be reunited to the flock can't emphasize this enough the christian story is not about you and jesus it's about you and jesus and everybody else that's following jesus gospel pronouns are we and us and y'all not i and me and singular you unfortunately in the english you and you singular and plural are the same word so oftentimes we read the bible and there's you plural all over the place but we miss it because we just apply it you singular jesus is absolutely committed to you individually so much so that he will leave 99 to come and get you to come and rescue you but once he finds you listen to me carefully his goal is not eternal fellowship with just you his goal is eternal fellowship with you and everybody else in the flock. Which is why membership in a local church is so significant. Because you're saying it's not just me and Jesus and sometimes we take a hike. It's saying it's me and Jesus and this local flock. Because you're united to Jesus, you're united to his church. In light of this, I asked Joy, who's leading us today, hey, for communion, find a song that has a lot of first-person plural pronouns. We's and us's. So we're going to sing, We Will Feast in the House of Zion, which we sing often. And she said, is it okay if we sing, we will feast? I know we do it a lot, but Link, to be honest, I can't find very many. And that's the point. This summer, I am um, I'm watching what... I used to kind of say this may be my favorite television series of all time and and now I'm I'm ready to come out and say it absolutely is and forever will be my favorite television series of all time Friday Night Lights not the movie not the book the television series which really is not about football it's about football but it's more about the characters in the story and what I love about Friday Night Lights is that every every character is in need of redemption and they get to taste it in certain very tangible beautiful ways so the other night and I'm like I don't cry very easily man I watch Friday Night Lights I ball like a baby watch it by myself <laughs> so in the most recent scene I'm in season three 
they got a big game. It's also – so Coach Eric Taylor is the head coach. His wife, Tammy. It's Tammy's birthday on the day of the big game. And she very wisely says, like, a couple days before, hey, we let's just not celebrate my birthday today. It's a playoff game. She's thinking if he gets beat, the last thing I want to do is hang out with him on my birthday. <laughs> but Eric, to his credit, he goes ahead and he, he gets – Julie, their oldest daughter, to take care of their youngest daughter, Gracie Bell. He books a hotel room, chocolate-covered strawberries, champagnes, all going to be waiting, waiting for them, and he, he's committed to it whether they win or lose. Well, they win, so now he's super excited about it. So he steals her away. It's a total surprise. They're in the hotel room enjoying the champagne, the chocolate-covered strawberries, celebrating her birthday and their marriage. And then Tammy's cell phone goes off, starts ringing. And she looks at it and says, it's Tyra. And her husband, the coach, gives her a look of, I know you have to answer it, and it's okay. Tyra's a student that she's the principal. She's been working with her forever. She's a lost sheep. There's no more lost sheep in Friday Night Lights than Tyra Collette. And she'll have moments of redemption and being found, but she keeps wandering away. And this time, she's left town with a rodeo star, gone all the way to Dallas. And he is mistreating her. And she's bawling on the phone, and she says, Can you come get me? And in the middle of celebrating her birthday, she looks at her husband and he just grabs his keys. And then she grabs the strawberries and the champagne and says, I'm taking this with us. <laughs> they drive all the way to Dallas, and they rescue her. Because rescue necessitates sacrifice. It's really interesting in the New Testament to close. Jesus is referred to in the book of Hebrews as the great shepherd of the sheep. But in the Gospels, John the Baptist looks upon him and says, there's the Lamb of God looking at Jesus that takes away the sins of the world. Friends, here's the Gospel. The great shepherd of the sheep first had to become a sheep and he was lost and instead of being rescued and carried upon the shoulders of another he carried something on his own shoulders he carried a cross and he was left all alone and he was abandoned and no one rescued him so that he could rescue you. If his shoulders can carry the sin of the world, then he can carry you back home. The question is, do you know you're lost enough to ask him to? Because he most certainly will. Just let him. Jesus you are the great shepherd of the sheep who became a lost sheep in order to find us. There's a lot of irony in these gospel themes. And we need you right now by the power of your Holy Spirit to impress them upon us. Would you show us our need for you? Every person in this room needs a Savior. We all need a shepherd we all, like sheep, have wandered off. We are like Tyra. We're lost. And we plead for your rescue. In Jesus' name, amen.